Welcome to the new episode of the No Secret Source podcast. My guest on this episode is Rory Palmer. Rory is a personal trainer, property investor, martial arts coach, and author. In this episode, we will talk about property investment, business, personal training, martial arts, and Rory's journey from one GCSE to financial freedom. I'm really excited to bring you this episode because we get to speak about Rory's journey from his early days in school, how he got through his first few businesses, how he started, how he failed, how he nearly got expelled from school, how he followed his dad as a role model and start investing into property that eventually got him from one GCSE to financial freedom. Rory will open up and give us a few insights and key principles and ideas that got him from zero to financial independency. We're going to have a chat about how he got started into personal training, how he grew his business and also martial arts. We will talk about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Rory is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. Rory is also author of two books, one of which I have right here. It's called Financial Freedom. You can find this book on Amazon. I gave this one a read. It's a pretty good book. It will give you a few insights into Rory's journey from the beginning and how he got started into property investment and what are his plans moving forward. With that being said, I hope you enjoy episode four of the No Secret Source podcast. Rory, welcome on the show. Charlie, thank you for having me, kind sir. Good to be here. <laughs> nice to see you again. Um, after a nice jiu-jitsu session last night, Got me back in the gear again. I was thoroughly enjoying that, I must say. To be honest, I'm I'm actually excited to to get some rolls back in the gear because it's just a such a difference mm. to go from gear to no gear and from no gear again to gear. And I had this time in between where I haven't done gear that much. And there is a part of me that loves the gear game. Yeah. So just to have that possibility of just going back and actually doing a little bit of gear, it's just you know yeah it's good fun yeah brazilian jiu-jitsu we are talking about it and <laughs> yeah it's uh i think it's lovely to do both you know and uh yeah it's just a sport i absolutely love and you're very good as well I've got the oh. most relaxed style i think i've ever seen I love it <laughs> don't know you just say so patient and calm it's brilliant thank you thank you is this is actually something i've um encountered not long ago i was a bit spazzy at the beginning but um not long ago, I had a chance to meet one of my friends now. Um, his name is Nick. He's a um, he's not very big. He's very small, very skinny. He's about 60 kilos. Um, he's a purple bell. He's extremely skilled. He's the most gentle assassin I've ever met. Yeah. As soon as I've rolled with him, I just realized, oh, God, there yeah, is so much to this game. Levels levels to everything the, life, isn't it the amount of taps the amount of time i got swept by yeah. someone that was half my size yeah. it's just ridiculous that's the beautiful thing about jiu-jitsu though isn't it because it was designed for the smaller man to beat the bigger man really by by leverage yeah um but yeah that's fantastic. and also at the same time i always like to believe that um Jiu-Jitsu is, I don't know if it's the right way to say it, but it's more cerebral and then physical. Yeah, well, I can understand what you're saying. Right. It, you, you have to solve a mental puzzle. Yeah, it's always described, people never talked before, it's like human chess. Exactly. The more moves you know, the ones you're skilled at, the more chance you've got of getting a win or advantageous position. Exactly. And yeah, there's something very beautiful about that. Half for uh, anyone to understand who have not rolled. But, uh, <laughs> but Rory, it's great to speak to you. And obviously, um, I'm excited to find out a little bit more about you and your beginnings. Um, for anyone that doesn't know you, I want to ask you first, who is Rory? This is the question, Charlie. Who is Rory? Who is Rory Palmer? Um, I don't know. I think I'm just a normal guy, really. Just very lucky I get to follow my passions in life. Um, 
So it sort of feels like I never really work a day in my life, which I think is a very privileged position. I'm very, very lucky to have that because I just do what I love and then I make money out of that. And every day is a fun day. So yeah, I, I feel very, very blessed. That's great. I'm just going to run it back. I'm going to go back in time okay. from your early days. Um, can you tell me where have you grew up? Oh, so I actually grew up all over the place. Got We were moving all over England when I was younger. Um, Dad was quite into property and we sort of ventured here, there and everywhere. Um, and yeah, so we even ended up overseas for a little while um, in the Isle of Wight, which I, that counts as a 45 minute cat and ring ride. It counts. <laughs> Didn't like the Isle of Wight. But then um, from the age of 12, we've moved back into Ashford, Surrey, where we live now. And I've never left since then, but I absolutely love Ashford. Amazing. Now, because I've I've read your book. Um, You've read it now. I've, I've read, read it, it now. Oh, the film the first year. I know there's a few things that happen in between. Yeah. From Margate. Yeah. Isle of Wight. And then, obviously, Ashford. There are some things in between, right? I want to touch up on that, if you can expand on that. Yeah, um, so yeah, life was very sort of up and down, I suppose I would describe it as a child. Very happy child, I was very, very lucky with mum and dad. They were always um, extremely loving and supportive and, you know, I had a lovely sister, we were, everyone got on well. But then my mum and dad did have a few tricky times. Unfortunately, they lost everything in the 90s recession and we fell on hard tyres. Mum and dad broke up and then we was in emergency housing for a little while and um it was an experience it was definitely like a bit of a fall from grace one minute you're in this massive house in margate um and my dad was driving around in the porch it was on holidays like seven eight times a year and then you know you're in emergency housing and you're sort of sharing a bathroom with everyone that sleeps on the same sort of floor as you and you've got a little room damp cold room but we had shelter and we had food because they provided breakfast at the this sort of emergency accommodation we we're staying at, I still feel very very lucky. But um, you know, it was a hard time for my mum because she was, she didn't have any money and she raised them two young kids and you know yeah, so it was a bit of a tricky time. But as kids were quite resilient, but it's probably it was much harder for my mum. Do you manage to find um, the fun in the bad situation because you were young, right? Definitely, and he definitely felt like, you know, my mum and dad weren't getting on very well at the time, and obviously there was a lot of love there and sort of twisted feelings. Um, you know, I just wanted to try and be supportive for my mum. She was going through a hard time, and, and my dad as well. Like, I always hear I worship my dad. Um, but, yeah, that was a that was an interesting time, but honestly, I'm so grateful for it because I feel like challenging times rounds out your character, makes you appreciate things when you do finally get something or start doing a bit better in life. So you know, I, I wouldn't change it for a second, personally. You think that experience impacted the future of your life from there on in any way? I think it did, actually, because it made me realise, um, you know, people sort of say money is it important, this, that, and the other, but when you haven't got any, then it does become extremely important. Like, it's not that important, but it's up there with oxygen. You know, it's when you really are struggling to put food on the table and, you know, you and it sort of was a big catalyst of my parents breaking up. So I think it, it did sort of register with me and I was always quite money focused as a child. I wanted to save my pocket money and not spend it on toys. And I was quite always thinking for the future a little bit. So I think it probably did have a, an impact, yeah. And um, I want to touch up on your school days. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't go so well there. <laughs> What's happened there? Tell me a little bit more about that. Um, I don't know. I think school really wasn't for me in this. And I loved school um, in the sense I had lots of friends, quite popular, very sporty academically I always um, struggled a little bit if I'm being honest I wasn't the brightest spark when it came to like traditional education just wasn't that interested 
and I suffered a little bit with dyslexia as well, so I sort of struggled, struggled with my words. I had to go off to this special class with the kids that literally just into the country, didn't speak any English, and I'm in there with them, like learning my real basic stuff. So I suppose it was a little bit embarrassing um, getting taken to that class, and yeah, but it is what it is, and just because you don't necessarily do well at school doesn't mean you're not going to do well in life because they are very different. I'm just going to ask you, what were your favourite subjects when you were at school? PE, 100%. It was the only GCSE I got was a B in GCSE PE, which I'm very proud of. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was definitely PE. I actually loved history as well. I find it fascinating. History always repeats itself. Um, so, yeah, that, that topic I really enjoyed. But, yeah, I was running a bit short after that. Was it any teacher during your school time that has impacted your life in any way positively? Because I know, positively. yeah, negatively could be many things, right? You, you, yeah. We all have that teacher that we absolutely yeah. dislike. Yeah. I'm not going to say hate, but we definitely dislike with yeah. passion. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll have a few of those. But at least in my example, has always been at least one teacher that said something or done something that opened up your eyes for a different perspective yeah teachers have a very important part so they really like they got confidence in you you can start doing better i think the reason actually I, I started to like history i wasn't very good at history then i had one teacher that sort of showed a bit of interest and said i was really good and then it really spurred me on to start learning and i was like wow this this is like changed everything just by the teacher changing um, but I was very lucky actually with my form tutor when I was at junior school. She was lovely, and my senior school um, form tutor, I was like, um, you know, the class favourite, and she loved me, and it was lovely, and I, I really thought the world of her. And I actually really liked my headmistress at my senior school as well. She was really lovely, um, really good to me. Lots of the other kids didn't like her, but I got on really well with her. And but in my junior school, the headmistress hated me with a passion was he the dragon she was the dragon she was the dragon in the book she really hated me yeah um and she yeah, tried to expel me a few occasions um yeah some of it was my fault some of it i think she might have just had it in me a little bit i want to touch up on a on one of the reasons why you nearly got expelled it was I believe your first entrepreneurial. Yes, that was my first entrepreneurial experience. There you go. Um, actually, went really, really well. To be fair, for my first go, so I was the first person to have a Game Boy in my school, and another friend of mine had loads of Game Boy games. So we went into partnership. It was my first partnership, um, and we started renting out the Game Boy, and it just sort of someone said. One day, oh, I have your Game Boy for a pound whilst I'm playing it with these games. And then my sort of the penny dropped. I thought, oh, yeah. I'll do a minute here. If you'll have it for a pound, then there were people would have it for a pound, then they would take it home for 15 pounds and you know use it for a whole day for 10 pounds. And then, yeah, that sort of really kicked in my head. And I was actually started making quite good money out of this Game Boy because no one else had it. My dad took me to London one day. We bought it in the shop and it just wasn't about. So I had this little window where I was the only person. We never had anything like that before. So kids were going mad for it. And I started coming back with pocket loads of cash. And uh, I was very happy about that. But then it, the wheels come off eventually, sadly. The dragon found out. Well, she did find out. But um, one of my best friends, still one of my best friends to this day, actually, he borrowed it for a whole week with all the games. And it was basically the price of what you could buy the Game Boy for. Roughly, that was like 120 pounds. But like back when I was like nine, ten, that was actually quite a lot of money. So we gave him the Game Boy, the games. He gave us the money. Um, but it turns out he liberated the money from his parents' shop. And um, the dragon, my head, head mistress at the junior school, um, said that we had obviously intimidated him to steal the money as he was a very good kid we were maybe not so good but he was one of my best friends and there was nothing like that at, at all and said we were going to get expelled so our parents were called into the school and um yeah i just 
remember walking away feeling really sad because I loved my school and I thought, I'm going to have to change to a new school. I don't really know anyone. Um, yeah, my dad and my mum sort of fought my corner. I could hear him shouting with the headmistress, but she was adamant, like, no, they're getting expelled because, you know, her exact words were, first it's this and then it's drugs in the toilet. So, yeah. <laughs> that's a transition. That's a quite a tra- That's what my dad said. <laughs> And I've never even touched drugs, never never smoked a cigarette, never drunk alcohol. So, yeah, she was way off there. But luckily, my friends, mum and dad, who I got on very well with, came in and said, no, this is my friend's fault. We had not intimidated him in any way. So luckily, we were reinstated back in the school. And, yeah, I managed to see it out in that school. But that was my first business adventure. Um, sadly, got shut down. <laughs> but it was good. I had to give a lot of the money back as well, sadly, which I was very annoyed about. But it is what it is. But it was a great experience. It was a great little learning experience. And I was quite young. I sort of started a little business without really realising I had. Was there any lesson learned at all from that experience, from that entrepreneurial? <laughs> there was actually, yeah. I think it was. I think that was my first little introduction to supply and demand. Like there was massive demand, there was no supply. So then I could charge money for something and I was like oh and that really interested me um and it was great just making this money but it felt so easy to make it wasn't physically really working I just had something that other people wanted yeah that definitely stuck with me my mum and dad were, even though I almost got expelled they were very encouraging of me trying especially my dad he was very entrepreneurial so yeah it was, it was good and bad to take away from it so definitely your dad <clears throat> was the most entrepreneurial yes, in your family. Yeah, and, 100%. Um, was he the one that you were looking up to the most? Yes, my my dad was my absolute hero. I idolized my dad. Um, yeah, I just wanted to be like my dad, I suppose. And he was like always running lots of different companies and lots of them failed. Some of them went really well. But yeah, I always really looked up to him in, in all aspects, and including my dad was a boxer, so I think that's what I got into martial arts as well, because was, you know, like I say, like my dad was my hero. So through your dad doing sports and business, all that influence got you, obviously something clicked in your mind and actually you picked up all these information about ways to do business and you've seen all these possibilities around and obviously martial arts as well. So that influenced you growing up Definitely. right yeah um i want to keep going after your first um business the game boy what happened after that so after obviously we couldn't rent out the game boy anymore otherwise we were going to get expelled uh, which was very sad as it was obviously a nice little earner at the time yeah, and then business come to a grinding halt after that didn't really do any businesses just little sort of cleaning the wheels of people's cars, that sort of job, but nothing very good, hard work, not a lot of money to it. And then when I went to senior school, I had lots of little businesses, some with some success, some not so successful, but it was all experiences. I used to go over car boots and sell novelty lighters. And then at my school, sold electric bikes, sold bikes from police auctions that had been stolen and got bought cheap and sold my boot fares. And I'd say I had very mixed results so you clearly stuck to it you clearly stuck to the to the to the business journey you still did your bits and pieces there you 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 didn't go towards the academic route yeah I, and no i didn't and you know because i saw my dad and my mum always be sort of making that own money i just sort of saw that's just how i wanted to do the same thing i didn't want to work for someone someone tell me when I can have a holiday, what I can do, can't do, it really doesn't sit well with my personality. And I think that's why with the teachers as well, some of them, they got it and they were good and there was like a certain level of respect to me got on like a house on fire and some were just like the authoritarian teacher just never sat right with me. And I realised probably not going to be very good working for someone else. Great. Wow. <laughs> he seems like... This sort of character traits repeat themselves throughout people that are following the path of business. They're following the path of 
becoming an entrepreneur, whatever the character traits you just uh, set out now, it just seems like it repeats. I think it is quite common because hey, you very, were quite naughty as well yeah, at school there, Charlie, yeah. which I'm very surprised about. You've got such a calm, easygoing demeanor. But yeah, so obviously... It is a common thing. I just watched the uh, Sylvester Stallone documentary and he got expelled like 12 times. I did not know this, but it didn't surprise me either. It's just something to do with your authority. Mm. <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah. Just It's just something to do with being told what to do, when to do, how to do it. It's just, it doesn't sit well. No, God, no. It just, you know, if, if I want to go on holiday, I just want to go. Don't want to say, oh no, you can go. Oh, just I can feel myself like tensing up just even thinking about that. So, and I think it's just because that's the environment I was brought up in. Maybe my mum and dad always did their own thing. And it again, like it just seems the subjects that you were being taught at school because of the fact that you were not interested in them, you just sort of put them away because you had the hunger for knowledge. Because mm. later on. You um, follow the path of becoming a personal trainer, right? Yeah. So you start educating yourself and learning about personal training and how you can help people achieve their goals in their fitness journey, right? It just seems like in school, we don't like it, I say, because of the subjects that we've been Thought, not because we don't want to learn it's the fact that we get thought something that we don't want to learn at that time it doesn't make sense for us then we just want to learn something else but we don't know what you know it's just a interesting yeah it is and I just think I just think schools are like outdated they're designed to just churn out employees there's nothing really like really encouraging or sparking right start your own business you know da, da, da. even business studies when I was at school was just like an IT class, in essence, learning computers. It wasn't really anything to do with business. I was really surprised I didn't like business studies because that was what I was interested in, but there was no business studies in it. Maybe it's different now. But, yeah, I just feel like school's are always like 20 years behind the, the learning curve. And, you know, the fundamental things like basic maths, English, you know, vitally important. But some of the other stuff, I don't know, just, yeah, not, not as keen. But we're very lucky to get free education, you know. And if you want a specific sort of field, like I'd become a lawyer, doctor, then maybe it's very, very different. I want to go on the path of what made you choose the personal training. Uh, that was easy because that was the only thing I was probably going to be any good at. Because uh, physically, <laughs> you know, there wasn't a surprise that my one GC, the GCSE was in PE. And even like the, the written side of that failed. So that's why I got the B and not the A, which I surely should have got considering I was in like every sporting team and, you know, athletically it was very, you know, that was my talent. Um, so, yeah, I always wanted to be a PT. And I remember, you know, when I used to come at the you know, school, sort of person comes around and say, what do you want to do? That's what I wanted to do. But then in the day I was saying I had to go to university and study science I you know when I could feel myself just glaze over like oh god like no that's not, not my me. I just no that's not my path I don't want to be here now let alone going on for another four years and whatever get into debt it's not for everyone it worked for me and how did you get started into your learning as a PT so um I went to college briefly and then I was <laughs> I left college Slash got kicked out. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I got kicked out of college. After a few months, I was just sort of carried on from school, messing around. It was rubbish. I was with all the naughty kids I was at with at my last school, and it just sort of carried on, and I realised I was wasting my time. I wasn't turning up and misbehaving. So then I left and become a removal man, um, which my dad owned a removals company. So I started working for him. Liked it for about six months and then it's that sort of, that ended and it was hard work every day lifting boxes, furniture for relatively low pay. I remember looking at people that have sort of been removal man for 20, 30 years and thinking, you know, I just, this is not the future 
I want. My dad really wanted me to take over the company because he was earning good money at the time, but I just had no passion, no desire, and it wasn't just about the money. I wanted to do something I actually enjoyed and had a passion for. And then one day I was on a really hard job and sort of half falling asleep in the lorry waiting for keys. Of You have to wait for keys for people to sort of, when they're moving house, and they come up, Joy, become a personal train, trainer of joining Premier and I was like wrote down a number frantically and then Sign went home up. yeah 100% <laughs> went home that night said to mum and dad oh, I want to become a personal trainer like that's it I'm sort of giving him a notice here and after the initial shock from my dad he was actually very supportive and so was my mum as always and yeah I, I, I never looked back I was so glad I had changed over yeah and I love it that's great. How was the first day as being a PT? Um, honestly, I couldn't believe how much easier it was in the gym because you start off just as a fitness instructor, just sort of walking around, writing programs out and whatever. And I was like, wow, this is what this is a day's work. Just talking to people at the gym, writing fitness programs for them compared to like lifting furniture all day, which I had been doing, and even though I took like a massive pay drop compared to what I was earning full time. So I was getting paid like a man's rate at um, 17 when I was working for my dad. But I just remember thinking, wow, I'm just so much happy do happier doing this. But it did actually take a bit of confidence and a bit of training um, to have a confidence to go to someone and say, oh, you know, I do personal training, I can help you out. Because I was only 18, I'm talking to like 38, 40 year old men who are sort of looking at me like, who's this young kid? Tell me what to do. So I actually used to lie about my age when I first started. I used to say I was 25, and because I was quite big, I got away with it. Um, and it worked. And one of my clients, who I still train to this day, um, you know, I admitted to him years later, like, I'm actually 25 now, and not <laughs> seven years before. Did you ask uh, me you invented the time machine? <laughs> I, did, I did. You said, why did you say that? And I said, because I just want you to take me seriously and didn't think you are. I was just an 18-year-old kid. Um, but yeah, he's forgiven me, so it's all good. <laughs> it does make sense, though, because you're going to get people, like you said, older people start judging you, like, what was this 18-year-old yeah, kid you can understand teach me it. how to lift weights? yeah. I, I could completely understand that. So, yeah, it was a, just a little political license there with the age. Hey, was it was it hard to get us started? Honestly, um, yeah, it was. And there was no personal training actually at the gym um, where I started. And it was me and uh, my friend John Ashwood. Um, he'd just become a personal trainer as well six months after me. And we started PT off there and and he was going like much better than me straight away and I could tell he was going up to people and asking them and he was putting himself out there a lot more and it actually really inspired me to like push on a bit more and do a bit more and break out of the comfort zone so yeah I was, I was grateful to have him on board as well next to me yeah and then I just want to find out from you what were the first or the top three skills that took you from zero to being extremely comfortable and very productive as a personal trainer top three skills to me do you know what it's actually working on my self-confidence and self-belief was i would say was the most important thing and i used to listen to these um nightingale nightingale conan cds and you listen to all these speaks about sort of believing in yourself and you can only achieve what you can believe and blah, blah, blah. And I love that. And I used to just drive around, listen to them over and over again. Never used to listen to radio. I still don't now. I always listen to something educational whenever I'm in the car because it's like free learning time. Um, yeah, that was a big change for me. And yeah, just once you start training one person, get a bit more confident, naturally leads on to someone else because they get good results. Um so yeah that confidence actually and believing in yourself they were they were right up there and then obviously just experimenting learning your craft because even when you qualify as a pt you're you're just a baby still you used to what so much learning to do and you start need to learn after the course about where you want to sort of specialize in amazing thank you <laughs> <laughs> i just want to move on i know obviously in the meantime from being a pt there was a change. Something has happened when 
you and your dad decided to buy property. Yeah, well, I actually started that weirdly at the same time because I bought um, a property when I was 18, which I suppose is fa fairly young um, to buy your first property. And my dad was buying properties, and obviously when I was a removals man, I was going around to people's houses a lot, and I was noticing, you know, some of these really big houses, they, were, they owned property, that's what they did. They bought and sold property, they're property developers, or they were landlords, so it sort of something clicked in my head, and seeing my dad doing it as well, I was very inspired, and I didn't have the money to to do it on my own. So I joint venture with my dad. We bought property um, from auction, uh, Barnard Marcus Auction in Northwood, a flat above a shop which needed completely renovating, and my dad sort of just let me handle it all. At 18 which was a good experience I was a confidence builder as well because I had to deal with these really rough and ready builders who were amazing and to do the property up and after a lot of chasing the builders out of the pub because they just wanted to be down the pub and not be doing the work and we had a real nightmare with them but eventually we got it finished and the job was actually good and we made our money I made more more money in that one deal than I did working all year as a removal man when I was 17 and yeah the, definitely the, the penny started dropping and I thought I definitely want a bit more of this and so a lot that was the eye opener it was a real eye opener for me and I thought wow you know the amount of time I've actually put into this and I've made this amount of money where I was working all day killing myself as a removal man and I made a lot less you know it was, yeah, it was a bit of a, a eureka moment I suppose so that was the first deal that yes. you done? that was the first deal I'd done. And yeah, we sold the property, made our profit, and then we bought another one straight away once once that had gone through. And it was a rinse and repeat, um, buying it at auction again. Um, got something called Bridging Finance, which is like a short-term high-interest loan, which we'd done previously before. And um, yeah, it was... It was an experience and we actually got let down with the bridge in finance because it was a really like sort of like a wild west back then and they didn't lend us the money and my dad had to go and borrow all the money on credit cards to to get this property otherwise we were going to lose our deposit which is uh 10 percent of what we were buying it for which was a lot of money for us back then but we managed to do it then we got our traditional mortgage with like paid off the credit cards and yeah, I still own that property to this day. And yeah, we were trying to sell it, couldn't sell it, but it was the best thing that ever happened is didn't. And now it was like worth obviously a lot more than when I bought it back then. Was it harder to keep it over this long time? Were you always tempted to, shall we just sell it? Or Do you just... know what? I, once I sort of realised and started educating myself on property and investing, and I sort of realised that, the profit really is made owning assets for like longer, longer periods. Um, then I sort of completely changed tact. I didn't want to buy it and sell as much. I wanted to retain as much as possible and then just look into the future because, you know, property is a fantastic hedge against inflation and um, your money's always losing money in the bank. But in, when it's in an asset like property, it's keeping pace and going up slightly and yeah that's how people sort of really get really wealthy in the long term in property can you walk me through obviously we know from your first deal and then the second deal the property that you still have can you walk me through what happened after that so then after that me and my dad uh, kept on buying properties at auction and we were buying them and there was a product then where we've mortgage express um, where you could basically we're buying properties like quite a lot below the market price at auction you're taking a bit of a risk at auction um, and then we were then remortgaging the properties and getting all our money back out again and sometimes plus some so we're getting paid in essence to own the property which was amazing um, and it was all going swimmingly well and then the 2007-2008 cr property crash came then that product then stops and then it was a little harder to do that strategy anymore because um, it was only the one lender that was doing it, which was Mortgage Express at the time. So then we had to pivot and do 
other stuff. How did um, 2008 affect you and your dad? Um, it was tough, to be fair, especially for my father, to be honest. For me, it's actually pretty good. Um, and I bought one of the best deals I ever bought, actually, in 2008, because it was just, you know, no one wanted to buy. There was lending. You could you had to put 40% down to get a buy to let. A lot of people didn't have that. Um yeah, so there were some amazing deals to be had. And I just really wish I had loads more money because I would have just would have bought everything I could have and would have been doing even better now. But yeah, my dad it was a bit tougher because he owned a removals company. Obviously, removals just fell off the side of a cliff. Plus, he had issues with some of his properties. So yeah, it was a lot tougher, tougher time for him and mum financially. But for me, it was it was pretty good. So did you, you kept investing through 2008? I did, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I bought a property which um, had an annex on the side and I managed to split that into two, really increase the value, and that gave me a new idea of, oh, okay, like if I can buy one property, split it, and I can increase the value massively. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'm very Just keen. Walk me through that deal because that's an interesting story. I want to hear the whole story. Um, yeah, so so I bought, a, I walked into a property and then um, next door was this, like, where the granny had stayed and it was all just as one sort of thing with nothing fenced off. And as I'm walking around the first bit of the house, I was unimpressed, run-down property, and they went, oh, you see next door? And I was like, next door? And then they were like, yeah. And so I walked in. I was like, oh my God, I could just see if I can just split the the gas, the electric, the water and fence this off, this could be a completely separate property and I'm really going to boost the value. Never done anything like that at the time. But I bought that property and it was like the best property I might ever bought, um, I'd say financially. And it was, it was, I bought it real low because the market had tanked, no one was buying. And that's the time to buy a property, in my opinion, when everyone is leaving the market saying, you know, the sky's falling, get out now. That's the time to go in. When everyone's going, buy, 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 be careful. And then um, I just want to find out, in your opinion, if um, I'm at the beginning, I'm 18 year old, what is the advice you would give me to get started in a property investment? I would say educate yourself first. You know, the, the most powerful thing any of us have is between the ears what's in our mind. And with knowledge, then you can go on and do amazing things. And then after that, it would also be to build your self-confidence and your belief. Because once again, you can have all the knowledge, but if you don't have the belief in yourself and the confidence, you're never going to go for it. So th those two together are a deadly duo. I think it's very scary to get your first deal. Yeah. And I really like your story because you had your dad with you and you were back to back going through all these deals mm -hmm. and um, you ride the storm and you came from through the other side on top. Well, yeah, try enough. Just, I just feel like I'm just at the beginning, though, really. Just feel like there's a whole other mountain to climb, which is much bigger. So I'm very excited to climb that mountain. Yeah, you you built all these experiences in the past, and obviously it's, it's going to help you in the future. But um, I'm curious to find out, with with the property investment, right, What were the first principles as you grew up that helped you during this time of getting in the property investment game and help you stay in it focused? And because it's an emotional game too, right? When you yeah, start, when you put the money down and you, you get into debt, but obviously it's, it's good debt, right? It's you have good. to turn it into good debt. And how do you stay focused and have a positive mindset when you know you're going into this game i think looking long term definitely helps people that are looking for like oh I've, it's, you know my I bought property and maybe now the recession's coming off i'm 10 grand less i want to sell it that's the wrong mindset in my opinion you just got to think long term property always outstrips inflation 
And if you're looking long term, it's, it's actually a very safe bet. As long as you're buying right, you know, you're not buying anything with massive issues you don't know about. Um, and you can cash flow yourself. Where, where I see people go wrong is they've got nothing left for a rainy day. And the rainy day is always going to come. You're always going to have something goes wrong. You know, the roof goes wrong. A boiler goes wrong. This is part of property and you have to have the money behind you to weather that storm. So if you're literally like always on red, eventually you're going to come a cropper. So having that rainy day fund is very, very important. And with everything that you know now, when you're going into a new deal, you want to go in, you've got a new property that came up, you want to check it out. What is your mental checklist? What do you go through? So that's that's a good one, actually. And so um, basically, I, I want to create value or I want to buy value. So I want to get a really good deal. It's really massively underpriced because for whatever reason, the people are very motivated to sell and, and money is not their main objective and for some people that is the case um or i want to be able to create value like that deal i was saying to you in 2008 where i can see i can massively increase the value if i do something here and maybe other people haven't seen um so that's a big one and also it must make monthly profit if i'm looking to keep a property for the long term it must make profit because if i'm losing money every month there ain't many i can buy but if they're always in the plus then i can buy as many as I can and what I want to. And let's say you found you found a good property. You 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 found this property. You can add value to it. How do you go about acquiring this property? Well, there's, there's different ways. Um, I like buying properties that are not actually on the market. So most people will go on to right move and look, and then you're competing with everyone else. And don't get me wrong, I've bought properties like that. And you can get a deal like that. And I would say if you're looking for motivated sellers, looking for properties with on with free agents, um, been on for a very, very long time, maybe it's only got one picture because the inside is looking pretty poor. These are all good ones to, to get a good deal. But buying ones that are not even on the market is the best one to buy because you're not competing with anyone then. Um, so that's some of the best deals I've got is that way and you can do that by building relationships with estate agents and actually letting agents that is an untapped market i've got some good deals from letting agents because you know they might have a disgruntled landlord that wants to sell but it's being rented out and then if they know that you're in the market they, they say to the letting agent oh yeah i'm fed up i want to get out they go oh i know someone that invests in property and that could be me or it could be you you know so your, your network is very important you said a motivated seller. Mm. What is a motivated seller? What is a motivated seller? Well, it's different things. You know, if, um, say, you're married, you're getting divorced, you hate each other, you know, your partner is making sweet love to someone else who they've moved in, you're going to be pretty motivated because you don't want to <laughs> stay in that situation. I know I'd happily lose 20 grand to get out of that situation because it's toxic. Um, so that is one. Sometimes it's people get in financial difficulty. They might have a hundred grand's worth of equity, but in three months they're going to lose their house. So they happily take, you know, seventy grand out and give me basically the thirty grand just so they got their seventy. Once again, I would do the same thing. So that that is ways you can find motivated sellers and help them get a sale. Um, obviously, you're looking to make money as well. But I think if you always going from the frame of how can I help this person how can I solve their problem how can everyone win that's always the, the best deal and it can be done and I like the fact how you point it out about networking yeah is it true even in the property game that it's not what you know it's who you know I think what you know is very important as well to be honest yeah. with you because uh, if you don't know anything then you can get taken for a ride for someone that knows a lot more. But your network is very, very important and having a good team around you, learning from people better, further down the road than you. Uh, it doesn't have to be a lot. You know, you might have one property, but someone's got five. You know, start learning from Go for a coffee with them. Start to to learn off of them what they're doing, um, you know, so you can get to that next stage and then find someone above that. It's uh, very important 
Yeah, uh, your network is very, very important. And go to network meetings, property network meetings. They're all over the country all the time. And some of them are like very, very cheap to go to. That's why I was curious to find out what, what are the ways in which you network? How do you find connections and how do you how do you establish the connection with these people with strangers in the in the game how, how would you do well, that different ways to be fair um and weirdly so um I, the barbers i go to i um they got a copy of my book there and i was sitting down and this guy was next to me reading my book and i looked <laughs> over and i had a hat on the scarf and i said a great guy actually wrote that book and he sort of looked at me a bit weird <laughs> And he went, are you Rory Pop? <laughs> I was like, yes, I am. It turns out he's got loads of properties. And I was like, oh, you know, we should go for a coffee. So that was just an example last week, which would happen. And it turns out he owns loads of properties. Um, so this is, this is a very easy way. That's never happened before, to be fair. But yeah, like going to estate agents, you get talking to people. Um, yeah, networking events are very, very important because you're just around other property people. And you can learn. And that that is how we learn, isn't it? Off other people, it's like learning jujitsu. If you're going to learn it, I'm only going to learn it on my own with a dummy. You're limited to what you can do. You need yeah. to be around other people that are also interested, and you can experience things and learn techniques off each other. So it's it's a very important thing. But you can also do this virtually. You can do it from books, you know, from seminars. Um, all these ways are a great way to learn as well. So, what would be the first? touch point for someone that is at the beginning of this of their game and they want to get in the property game and they need to go out and start networking will be the first thing to do mm, i mean i would say um go, go and speak to estate agents they know about property um i would go to a networking your local networking event and just start chatting to people make friends you don't have to have any agenda but just want to make friends build some contacts and you'd be amazing how these things can start spiraling into something more and then, yeah, just start reading books on the subject. Um, fantastic book right there, of course. Amazing. Um, <laughs> I read it. I enjoyed it. Oh, good. I recommend it. Oh, thank you very much. Very kind of I'm you. I'm waiting say. for the next one to come also. Oh, well, well, the next book actually is a children's book I'm doing. Uh, Here I'm a Little Champ and I'm raising money for charity. So it's nothing to do with property, but it's a great book to buy. And all the profits go to uh, kids' charities. So I get that one. Uh, but there, there will be another book coming in the future. How did you find writing a book? Obviously, you've been you've been doing property for a bit. You've learned the game, mm. and now you decided to actually share your story. How did you find that? Well, that's it, Charlie. Really, it was literally just I want to share my story. Um, I feel like I've got something I can help people. I want to put it in a very easy to read way i wanted to make it as easy as possible a quick read so it wasn't like you're reading you know war and peace and i started writing it over covid just a little bit every day but these five minutes here ten minutes here half hour it all starts to add up um yeah and it was a great experience it is actually easy book to read it's very enjoyable that's what there, I'm there are books that I've, I've read it's just you read through and then you get to a point where you just your mind dis disconnected mm. you, you'd have to get back into the zone and refocus again but with your book it just flows very nicely i just once you're in the story it's hard to come out yeah basically so that's how i felt i was just kept you know page by page page by page oh, really enjoyed it thank you it's very nice you to say and i actually like took lots of stuff out because i wanted to take out any fluff sort of thing i just wanted to give you a bit of a story because i think always this that's the nice thing some of the book my favorite books they sort of get you in with their story they draw you into that and then the learning sort of begins um yeah i just wanted to make it for people that don't read a book that's not very intimidating that was my objective there i think you accomplished it oh, you're you you're too well. kind sir <laughs> charmer charlie i'm too charmer <laughs> i think you enjoyed it. i really enjoyed it though oh thank you um i'm curious to find out what were the lessons learned in writing a book? Lessons learned were um, little minutes add up. So, you know, just doing two minutes here, 
and literally I had never never wrote anything before. I've actually really struggled with writing. I'm terrible at grammar spelling. It's like a massive weakness. Um, but just because I'm not good at that doesn't mean I can't partner up with someone who is very good at that. Like my editor, she's amazing. She's great at grammar spelling. So that was like really, really good. Uh, just to partner up with someone else. Just because you're weak at something doesn't mean you can't partner with someone else. And this is the bit I didn't like at school. It had to be all you. But in real life, you know, you, whatever you, wherever you're weak, you can delegate that out and you can play to your strengths. Um, so that was a learning experience. Um, yeah, and just, just get started. You know, you don't have to be perfect. Just get going and then just see what happens. That is um, the way forward. Yeah, just get, get going. That's the, the hardest bit, just getting started. What do I have to do you to convince you to turn this one into an audiobook? Not a lot to be fair. You've got to teach me how to do it. <laughs> well, it's a gig because I am, you know, I was a complete novice. I'd never done anything like that before. Um, but that is definitely the way forward. And yeah, that's something that I should do. Definitely. So yeah, you don't, don't you're not going to twist my arm too much on that one. Cool. So we need to get that one. Definitely. Sorted. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> That would be very good to add that onto your onto your resume. Well, it'll just be another learning thing there, isn't it? And once again, that's something I'm going to have to delegate out to someone that knows what they're doing. Because, you know, over my head, the same as doing a book, it was just a very daunting task, to be honest with you, to start off with. But, you know, you just, you just go along, you get to one red light, you don't know what you're doing, you learn. Okay, then you push on to the next one. And that's what we do everything in life. That's how I've done everything with property. I had zero clue what I was doing. You just, you start, you start making mistakes, you learn, you grow, you move on again, and you get hit another roadblock, and you're like, oh, you know, but that's with everything. Like same with jiu-jitsu, you know, you get tap, 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 and then you start improving, things tweak. And there's, uh, who like sports in general, teach teaches you that skill. Yeah, it's so much to your story. I'm, I'm extremely mind blown about from early days to where you are now property investor personal trainer and i want to touch up a bit on your martial arts journey mm. can you tell me how did you get started with the martial arts oh, so my dad was a boxer and obviously my, my dad was my hero he he boxed for hogarth boxing club um so i always had an interest and i used to go to um shows with my dad kickboxing shows and then when mixed martial arts came around it was actually illegal in the uk and the only place they would show it was in milton Keynes. it was the only place that they would have it in the whole of the country because lovely milton Keynes with all its roundabouts so and you had to be 18 to go and watch these shows and i was about 15 16 and my dad said like put on this big like workman's jacket and free jumpers and, you know, if you were there with me, we'd get in. And I did. And I was just watched it. I was fascinated that, you know, what what is this stuff that they're rolling around on the floor, people are tapping, I can't even see what what's going on. Like, why why have they tapped? What's got what's going on there? I just thought a boxer was gonna come in and just knock everyone out. And it was quite the opposite. The grapplers are coming in and just destroying everyone. They probably weren't even that good. They just knew three or four moves than the other person. Yeah. Yeah, and it became a, a bit of a fascination for me. Um, yeah, so I started kickboxing when I was 17, and then, then I got into mixed martial arts, and yeah, so I started training at this very rough club. I was surprised I was uh, turned out to be, as there was a lot going on um, at that club. Um, but it was a learning experience, and everything after that felt, felt quite easy, to be fair. But yeah, it was great, and I'm so, so glad I got started on it. I made some life, lifelong friends from it as well. A great achievement, black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Yeah, that was how, that was a big one actually. How did you find the whole journey up to the black belt? And obviously, the journey is not finished now. No, definitely not. No, absolutely, it's always learning to be done, and even now after training for so long you know i'm still learning things and, and it will never stop and i love that because as people we always want to progress and move forward obviously when you first start the like, learning curve is like here and then it does level out but you should always keep learning 
And yeah, no, getting my black belt, that was a very, very proud moment from my instructor, Z Marcelo, uh, who I greatly admire. He was a fantastic coach. He's actually one of the first Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belts who taught from Brazil in it, in the UK because there wasn't hardly any when I first started. There was literally like five, I think it was, in the whole of the country. And I was very lucky that he came over and I, uh, and I linked up with him and yeah and, I, and he's I went right from white belt to black belt um with with Z so do you and remember the, the first session oh my the mats? god um so I'd already actually trained in mixed martial arts for for a while I mean grappling and I thought I was pretty sort of tough um you know so I had grappled and knew some moves and then I remember my first rolling session with my instructor z and he just absolutely schooled me like i was a little kid i think i tapped down like eight times in five minutes and i could feel he was going really easy i just thought what the hell and i had mixed martial arts fights at this point and i just remember felt felt quite helpless but it was fantastic because it lit a fire to learn this sport and you know wow if, if he can do that to me then it's something that can be learned and you know i want to be the black belt that can do that and yeah, so it was very, very inspiring and humbling all at the same time. So yeah, it was awesome. And I'm so glad I got to do this sport because everything after life feels so much easier when someone's like strangling you and putting you in all these horrible positions. When you have normal day to day stuff, it all feels easy, doesn't it? After someone's like choking you out. So yeah. I, I always used to say when, when I do cold calling or whatever I do, if I go into a a little bit of a more tougher situation, right, I'm always thinking, is the other guy have any chance to choke me out? No. <laughs> exactly. It's good. not that bad. It's not we that good. bad. I mean, in today's <laughs> world where we're very safe and comfortable, you know, it's one of the more challenging things you can do unless you were part of the army and you got bullets thrown past you. It's probably the only step up really from that. So everything after that is easy. Like a job interview, well, oh, what's worse that happen? They're going to say no. Is that is it that bad? You know. So yeah, I think it gives you a good grounding. Everyone should learn a little bit. So do you think being part of martial arts and practicing martial arts impacted your life? One hundred percent. Yeah, I feel. I think it made me more confident. It made me deal with failure and success and learning that they are linked. You can't have one without the other. You can't have massive success without loads, if not more, failure. And that is a vital lesson for life there. You know, you have to be humble and sort of just take it on the chin and realise we are all human, we're going to make mistakes. But it's the learning, the growing and coming back. That's the, that's the important bit. We always used to have a saying for the jiu-jitsu. Um, when you get started, it's hard. But the first lesson you learn is you don't tap on the pressure. Mm. Pressure is there. Acknowledge it, accept it, and move on. Yeah. We don't tap to pressure. And I think that is a big, big, big change in one's mentality once you start practicing martial arts and then you go into business and whatever you said job interviews it's just it's nothing it's nothing yeah but it gives you a sense of perspective sometimes perspective can be lost if you never have nothing to push up against you know you never had any problems in your life you've got no sense of comparison but if you had some more challenging things you had to deal with in life and in martial arts you know grappling etc you, you're in a very uncomfortable position and if you can be stay all relaxed the all the time if you stay relaxed in that then you can take that out to life and in business you know it's very important there's no it's not a surprise that there's elon musk and uh, the guy for the facebook guys well they're zuckerberg. Le zuckerberg they're learning jiu-jitsu now it doesn't surprise me you know i think yeah. they were supposed to fight oh that'd be like, an interesting uh, one i think it's, it's going to be the greatest Zuck fight that pulled out that doesn't surprise me they yeah, both got a lot to lose but fair play to them for learning a little bit i can fully respect that zuckerberg is actually a blue belt now is he so yeah. he's, he's a bit yeah, of a ninja actually training both Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and MMA 
which is quite interesting. And it's brilliant because it's making the sport more mainstream. Exactly. You know, we're back when I first started training in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and MMA, people just thought it was human cockfighting. They didn't realise it was a sport. I my grandma and I was like mortified, uh, you know, being a, like a primary school teacher, very middle class. Um, but yeah, obviously it's a lot more so. It is a sport and a very awesome sport to watch in my mind. What is next for Rory Palmer? Mm, this is it. Well, like I was saying to you, I just feel like, especially with the property stuff, I feel like I'm just at the start and I'm going to be going up. So I want to buy loads more properties. I want to massively increase the amount I own, uh, the the passive income that's coming in for me. That's the thing I find really sexy about properties, the passive income, lying in bed, making money. That's the way to do it in my mind. As much as I love personal training, as soon as I stop personal training someone, that money stops. But making money while you're in bed, you're on holiday, that's really the way forward. So I want a lot more of that. And live a happy life to be happy in life is like the biggest gift i'm actually luckily very positive person but i want more of that i want to live a life on my terms answering to me and yeah then i will then once you know achieve hopefully the success i'm looking to achieve i would like to help the world and do nice things like i'm doing this book um for children's charities here on little champ i'd like to do more things like that and give away more money and help more people is like the further down the road goal um so yeah the future i feel is very very exciting is there any date in mind for the new book yes very soon actually and i'm hoping because it's all the profits going to charity people can get behind that more and it's and it's an anti-bullying book which is like something i feel very passionate about i'm sure a lot of other people do as well so yeah i hope it does well so if anyone supports it thank you very much I'm going to let them know as soon as that book gets published. Oh, greatly appreciate that. Yeah, because I'd love to, it to do really well. And then, you know, I could give more money to the kids' charities that really need it. Hopefully that makes a difference. That's a very good cause. And um, I'm looking forward, once the book gets published, then um, I'm more than happy to just jump on it and support it as much as I can. I uh, appreciate that. It's very nice of you. Yeah, and... Uh, Yes, and have a little, little, little mission and target, and I've yeah. got no clue how to promote a kid's book, so I'm very much out of my element. But this is a great thing, because then I'm going to learn, and then I'm going to evolve, and you know, when I do other things in the future, hopefully that's going to pay off. So, yeah, it's, it's all exciting. Right. Yeah. All exciting things for the future. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Life is exciting. Life is a gift in my mind, and I'm sure if we're healthy, you got your family with you, you... If you've not got a pound in your pocket, you're a rich person because a lot of people don't have that. So always be grateful for what you got. And a positive mindset, you know, that is like the greatest weapon in my mind you can have in life. Amazing. Rory, if anyone wants to follow you on socials, where can they find you? So on Instagram, it's Rory Palmer 10, spelt with a R on the Palmer because I spelled it wrong <laughs> when I first set it up. And on Facebook, it's just Rory Palmer. And you can follow me um, on YouTube, which is Rory Palmer Property. I release a new video every week just giving tips and tricks about property. Amazing. Thanks very much, Rory. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to speak to you. I think. I think we need to make a part two soon. I'm up, definitely <laughs> up for that. I absolutely love talking, as you can tell. So, um, yeah, I'm very much up for that. And thank you for having me as well. Thank you. Very good interview, Charlie. Very calm to me. The same as Jiu-Jitsu, the same in your interview style there. Thank very, you. very impressed. It was a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Cheers.